you're saying, I'm, I was asked to repeat the question, so I'll get it wrong, but it goes like something like this. That affordability is the problem around housing, and how can we develop a program that can, that can deal with that? Uh, well, no, my question actually, sorry. Was, my question really was, why aren't we limiting the number of residences any individual can buy so that it doesn't become a situation where people are buying up housing and they're really in the rental business? L limiting the number of buildings that, that would... Okay. We, 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 I'll make a little prediction. That will never happen in Canada. <laughs> well, that's that's an interference in the market that uh, I mean people would would uh, go absolutely snaky. The um, I think I think the government has to get into um, look. I'm not the only one. Planners, anybody seriously looking at problems, are saying we have to do it. That, this is a political problem. The, the, the conservatives never have wanted to do, to do this. The history of it is of affordable housing is Hannah Canada from the, right after the Second World War. If you, if, if you know your history, that there was virtually no building of housing during the Depression or the Second World War. You couldn't build them and they wouldn't, the government wouldn't let you. When, they, when peace came, there was a big housing boom, and the government of that day said affordability is a huge problem, and they built largely public housing, like Regent Park. We paid a price for that. The, the Trudeau government and others began experimenting in co-op and non-profit. I see Graham Mudge here. He probably knows far more about this than I do. They put money into that. That was cut largely by the Mulroney government, and finished off by the Liberals, by Paul Martin's uh, austerity budgets in the early 90s. And that's to our shame. I mean, we've, we've let that happen. And we're, paying, we're paying a huge, no, we aren't, I'm not. I, you know, perhaps people in this room are not, but young people are, young people are. And uh, we gotta do something about it. It's just too, too serious. In terms of that type of control, I don't think we'll ever see that type of control. It's just, it, it's against our ethos. You know, there are places in the world where they, where they do exactly that. Well, it doesn't have to be big control, but it seems to me, when you have a huge commodity in something that should be a need, a necessity, mm -hmm. that's why young people can't buy, they can't compete. Let me, let me, let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll get to this. <laughs> the, the other thing, housing is tremendously controversial, and should be, it should be, it should be. We're not building the type of housing we should, but there are enormous benefits to middle the middle class homeowner and the upper class. I mean, the biggest one that I know is uh, you don't pay capital gains when you sell your own um, principal residence. And uh, anybody who owns a house knows that's a huge, huge benefit, huge. You know, and what are the benefits given to low income people? Well, a few people manage to get on rent geared to income, you know, God bless them, because but the vast majority don't. And immigrants certainly don't have a hope you know, what's the waiting list of uh, Toronto housing? 100,000, 80, 90,000. You keep reading it in the paper and as I always bounced up another 10,000. Sorry. That's no, I just, uh, when she was talking, I had to take issue with some of what you're saying. It's not the millionaires buying a $3 million mansion that's, that's the cause of our problem. Quite frankly, I think the cause of our problem today is low interest rates. Now, I've been around yeah. long enough to yeah. know that house prices can come down. Yeah. So I think we've got a real yeah. problem now with low, yeah. low income. When I, when I bought my first house in 78, you could buy a house with one income. Well, you That's can't right. do that anymore. And, and so now everybody had that two income. And then the other thing that, uh, that, that got me going too is, is in, when I bought my first house in 78 out of Islington, everybody wanted to be out there. I paid twice as much for a two-bedroom bungalow because I would have paid for the mansion on Walmart Road. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be down there. It's changed around. Yeah. We're also living under the, this, I, I wouldn't call it a myth, but this idea that you have to own your house. Yeah. You know, I've got two daughters. The older daughter is only about four years difference between them. The oldest one lives down here in Little Portugal, bought a house, 30 years. That's the other thing. We, got, we have 30 year terms on our mortgages now. Yeah. Didn't exist when I, when I bought yeah. my place. The youngest one rents. The youngest one's further ahead because he's yeah. got a really good deal on the rental. He's putting money away. She, she understands and that 
for every thousand dollars she saves, she's saving about ten thousand dollars. Exactly. Exactly. The oldest one, well, okay, they're married. Now they've got a baby, yeah. so they need a house. So there's the, all these other issues that come into play, and and, and that's really what you know what we have to be very careful about here, especially the young people that are going out buying these condos and thirty-year terms and all that. Because there is a good chance the price could go down. Yeah, they could. There is a chance. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there, many, many of them are aware. Let me just respond to the, the interest. You're absolutely right about low interest rates, and I should have mentioned that. But, um, you know, the problem is for many, most of these people, young people, they cannot get the down payment together. I'm told, I mean, it's just, it's just that, that many young people that can do it is that they get family money. You know, the, the, the family collects the money and they get the down payment and then, then they're okay. But you know, a lot, of, a lot of families don't have that. They don't have that. Um, sorry, yeah. Hello? Oh, I was just going to say that, I mean, ownership is not excessive. I mean, that's what you're basically saying here, is that, yeah, and a lot of the other reason that's driven to some of the housing prices is that people who lost money during the last down, during from 2008, The market is driving it up. Like people are still wanting to get in. I'm sorry, I'm not, you're still. Um, I, w I wanted to give just a little like, like the world that I grew up in. You know, the ang I'm I'm pretty waspy. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you had to own a house. You had to own a house, and I did. I managed to own a house. Uh, I moved to Montreal. I lived in Montreal and, and was teaching in a sage up there for ten years. And it always surprised me. I, when I got the much, I had to buy a house. We lived in an apartment. No, I gotta buy a house. My French Canadian friends just said it was a little crazy. Why do you want to buy a house? You gotta fix the plumbing. You know, you gotta do the. You know, it's a cultural difference. You know, Montreal is largely um, a largely a tenant city, and people. But I can tell you, the rents there are. Well, when I was there, like we had a wonderful four-bedroom, rented a wonderful four-bedroom uh, flat for uh, you know under it was about three hundred dollars a month. Couldn't believe it. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't buy anything in Toronto for that. Graham, yeah. Well, the interest rate, low interest rate, is a big problem in terms of encouraging growth in the real estate prices.
Uh, Graham, you would know this, that um, the suburbs uh, were largely built with CMHC money, if I understand it, is that the developers would borrow money at low interest from the federal government, the uh, Canada CM, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And it, it was a huge economic uh, boon in the 50s, 60s, until they, until they began cutting back on those programs. Many of the high-rise in the, in the inner suburbs were built in the same way. So they, they were, the subsidy the government was giving at that time was essentially via the, via the developers, and uh, why, they didn't, um, why they didn't give it to the homeowner is beyond me, but I know that more efficient to give it to the... Uh, You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. The, uh, uh, the, type of, the type of proposal that is being made, for, for example, uh, Regent Park. The way Regent Park is being redeveloped, essentially it was the value of the land. The city gave some, some seed money. The developer borrowed, built the thing. The developer uh, you know, had the right to sell condos, something like 75% of the new units were condos. The people that lived in Regent Park before were moved back in. Now, those people are all on RG, rent geared to income. So there's a subsidy there, and that's, that's not an inconsiderable subsidy. But the, the new type of model of assisted housing that people are talking about will take some upfront money. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it, 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 you know, there, may, there may be some money that the government can't, re, can't sort of recoup in it, but the idea is that the majority of the money will come back to the government. So, you know, I'm not a financial person and, and there, are, there are people that I know who are, you know, really swift in all of this sort of stuff. And, you know, the, the government has every reason to, you know, want to, you know, they got to protect their, their, their investment. And when I say that it's got to be government, I really mean it's got to be government-led. We gotta have, we gotta, you know, it's gonna take some seed money. But, you know, individuals can't do it. Developers can't do it. You know, let's not, let's not blame the developers. They, they can't do it. You know, they're gonna do market, they're gonna get. So, so the government has to go in there. The government has to see. The, the type of model that I talk about in my book is what they call public-private partnerships. Okay, so the public, through some level of government, provides land, as it was in the case of Regent Park, or they provide seed money. They have a deal with the, with the developer on, you know, the developer's going to get so much, then the city's going to retain so much, and, uh, you know, the city always makes money in the long run because the value of the property has gone way up, and in, in, in taxes they're going to make money. So it's always the advantage. The federal government, not so much, but the city recoups it in the new value that there is there in their property taxes. Yeah. I think there was another partner in Regent Park, and that is Artscape. It's a cultural partner, and uh, I don't know exactly how it worked, but there was the developer, and I don't know who that was, it might have been some, somebody like um, Lantera or something, and the government money, but there was also Artscape. Artscape has Art, been very Artscape, active you know. in, in mm -hmm. developing properties and including commercial uh, rentals. It's a very good... Uh, Artscape, Daniels, Artscape is a very good example. Yeah, and Daniels is doing one down on the water. Daniels, too, Daniels is doing one there. Artscape, they're offering some artist yeah. spaces. Yep. Yep. But, but, but uh, you know, a lot of these things are, are, are going to, you know, those, the city is involved in uh, 
But but um, Artscape is not an agency of the city. It's an independent agency. I know and, that's uh, what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's I'm not, not sure just government. That, and do you do you know Graham? Graham's an accountant, and he knows a lot about these things. <laughs> City or the Board of Education didn't know what they what they were doing, or in one case in the Witchwood Barns, the, uh, the TTC, and um, you know so it was already a public asset, and uh, it cost money to renovate those places, and um, um, I'm not exactly sure where they got all that money, but um, they've certainly been a, a model. Incidentally, it's now being copied around the world, and. Uh, Tim Jones is going all over the world talking about this stuff. He's an interesting guy. But you know, essentially what we're talking about, what you're talking about is two systems of providing housing. In one system, housing is a commodity. It has become a commodity in our society. When governments brought in cooperative housing and subsidized housing, that's the only alternative that I know of that's actually worked. So we have to get the governments to get back into the business of building co-ops. And if, if uh, interest rates are low, why aren't we financing cooperative housing? Well, somebody else had a comment. Thank you. That's a very, very good uh, good I comment. vote for the right folks. They never seem yeah. to win. Yeah. I, I want to get, get off housing and on to something else. You made some interesting comments about communities and uh, talked about the housing on the avenues and the streets that yeah. support communities. Um, in your book, you talk about other ideas about um, strengthening communities. Yes. I am, I am a very strong believer. I better use the mic. And, and Sorry, we, we don't fact, all live on, on, and we don't all live on the island. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I, I am a very strong believer in, in uh, community because I've seen, I've seen what communities can do, you know, to pull things together and, uh, you know, uh, like a lot of people, I've been pretty distressed by what's going on in, in the city of Toronto and, uh, you know, I can, I'm, nobody employs me, I employ myself, so I'll get my own. You know, the, um, you know, the progressive voices have been, in, this once was one of the most progressive cities in North America and it's, um, we've just got to get back, you know, this has got to become a more activist government, but the only people that can make that happen are people at the grassroots. It's got to be driven by people at the grassroots. And, um, you know, I've, I've been involved in lots of things in, in, on, in Toronto uh, Island. You know, I've been involved in the, in the uh, fight against the island airport expansion, and I know the power of, the, of a community. It's very, very important, and it's something. It's something that every politician is listening for. And I, what's one of the things distressing is to see that you know, especially in the suburbs, you know, there are not enough. There's not enough community involvement. They're only interested in driving their cars and high taxes. And Neil, we've got to get out of that. It's just not working. Yeah, down to the back. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. Toronto has gotten a lot of very, very strong, very strong neighborhood associations. And that's where people, way down in the back, yes. Toronto Island Airport, you want my opinion? Yeah, 
No, no the date. Sorry? The, next, the date of the next event. When it comes back to council. When it comes back to council? Okay. In next year. September. No. No? No. Uh, uh, yeah, for, for those people that are interested, it'll be uh, clearly one of the important events when it comes back to council, if it comes back to council. I say if because they're, they're uh, both the federal liberals and the federal NDP have said that uh, they will not open the tripartite agreement, and that will, that will kill the JET proposal. We're just talking about the JET proposal, okay? If it comes back, you know, the, the Toronto Port Authority now is doing um, what they're calling an environmental assessment, um, and that's going to go on probably for another eight, nine months mm -hmm. before I would ever, ever see the light of day at City Council. If it comes to City Council, it's going to be as big or bigger an issue than the, uh, the Gardner Expressway mm -hmm. take down. I got to come they're, they're going to be rebuilding uh, Alexander Park next, and then the uh, Lawrence Park, I believe, and uh, all the big public housing that was built back in the whenever, you know, for that period, it began about 1945 and went up to, uh, they're still building them in the 70s or 80s, are they? Yeah, I think so. And the big ones are all going to be rebuilt. That's the plan. That's the plan. And and using the model. And why I talked about. And I, you know, I I I think we really got a we, a lot of very creative people got together to to. I know some of them, and uh, these are really really good political people. The people that uh, are far sighted uh, planners, and uh, the Daniels uh, uh, development company. Uh, uh, is it, the, it, Mitch Cohen is the uh, is the president. Very progressive company. I'm sure Mitch will make a lot of money. He's made a lot of money. But I don't care. <laughs> you know. So we're just about wrapping it up. It's uh, after two. Okay, we'll have. Let's do the one last. Okay, I just okay. wanted to. Sorry. Yeah, away you go. I just wanted to ask. You know, you mentioned this this new urban agenda, which I mean. Look, the technology has been there. I mean, if you go to Paris, Paris has been 10 story high for since Napoleon's time. District heating, it's all over Central Europe. It's not technology that's only this that. And then you were showing us uh, some of the planning that cities are doing, and they're thinking the same way. So they're not the issue. So who is the problem? You. Me. <laughs> what we have to do is become politically mobilized. And, 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 uh, it's easy to say that's the most difficult thing. What I tried to do in my book is sketch out, you know, what we had, should see as our objectives. So I started out by, by talking about the, what I said is the old agenda, you know, the building of the suburbs. Okay, we, you know, that's got to change. We cannot be designing our cities anymore for the sort of agenda where we build highways to accommodate more cars because they're all going to just get plugged. It's crazy. We've got to have an agenda where there's transit, where there's good affordable housing, where, where we, we reduce, we significantly reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emissions that, that we produce. We're producing a lot. Cities produce a lot. You know, we're 70, 70, 80 percent of the people in Canada live in cities and about 80 percent of the pollution that's being produced comes from cities. But, but I would take issue with, with your comment that I'm the problem. <laughs> I've gotten involved, no. Uh, uh, you're the solution. I should have said you're the solution. <laughs> what, I, what I'm trying to say is I've gotten involved in things locally yeah. in, in my area. And the biggest problem that we have with all this redevelopment <laughs> is the NPO, uh, uh, municipal work. The OMB. The OMB is a huge yes. problem. Yeah, they, huge they, problem. They, they, they're not in my community. Yeah. Read my book. I talk all about the OMB. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's a huge, huge problem. A huge we, problem. We have the same thing politics with our transportation system. Yeah. The company I work for, we were the program, program managers along with Delcan back in the 80s yep. for the Let's Move project. 
Now, the only thing that ever got built out of that was Mel Lastman's subway to nowhere, because he was the mayor. It cost us a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So, well, it, these are the people that are, are making our decisions. We've got these guys in the council meeting today. There's 50 some of them. You can't get 50 people to agree on anything. <laughs> so we're not going to ever get anything. You know, you know, we, we got to, sometimes I, I get, I've been a pretty polit political guy, you know, most of my life. I've been, you know, I never run for office, but, uh, you know, as I've, I, I, I hang out too often, too long in the upstairs of the council chamber. And we have huge political problems here. The politicians have to begin to lead. And, and you know, I, every chance I get, I, I say that provincial government has been wonderful on transit because $50 billion over 25 years just ain't peanuts, you know? That's a big commitment. No other government has done that in Canada, as far as I know. And, but we've, you know, we've got, we've got to get behind, we've got to get behind that type of thing. We've got to get behind a good affordable housing program, and we've got to get behind what may even be more difficult is a program that's going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. That's going to be forced on us, incidentally. That's going to be forced on us, and I, you know, I think it's better to get ahead of the wave myself. I just want to put a ray of light in here. I, I belong to a group called Green Renaissance on, uh, or follow it on Facebook. France just passed the law, does anybody else know this, that all new commercial developments have to have either a green roof or solar panels. We have that at the city. They have the law now. I didn't know that. Every building over 100 units has to have an industrial we, building. We have, we, have, we have probably the most progressive uh, bylaw on green roofs right here in Toronto. David Miller brought that in. And it's still in effect, incidentally. It was never, uh, it was never taken down. And, uh, well, we get the existing, you know how you were talking about commercial uh, activity in the, the commercial activity? Okay, the commercial yeah. activity opposite to my apartment. Commercial, if I said you should want to buy, buy my book, and, uh, it, but I will, I will make that, that pitch. That would, that would <laughs> yeah. that? We've got lots of books here, and uh, yeah. Jocelyn brought them Who's all the way down on her knapsack. So, uh, Which ward are you in? I think we should cut her. I know. I know. Uh, sure which ward? I want to thank you all for coming and for your questions. I know you could carry on discussion. Yeah, can tell you there's a great person. That's okay. And thank you so they much, Bill Freeman. There's a great person for you. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to sign the book.